My name is Ken Long and I'm a proud 31 year old Canadian. Hi, I'm Amri Maffedon and I'm 31 years old and I'm British. My name is Andrea Garcia Rodriguez, I'm 25 years old and I'm from Spain. My name is Corey Flesser, I am 35 years old and from the United States. My name is Claudia Manejan, 29 years old and I'm from Italy. My name is Martin Dimitrov and I'm 28. I come from Bulgaria. My name is Tanja Lacic, I am 27 and I'm a Romanian living in Belgium. Hi, my name is Güde Jensen, I am 31 years old and I am from Kiel, Northern Germany. Alice Pilongalon, I'm 28, French. My name is Mar Steinberg and I'm 35 years old, I'm Latvian. My name is Janu Kacilic, I'm 29 years old, I'm a European coming from Czech Republic. My name is Ulrich, I'm 32 years old. I'm a Danish national living in Copenhagen. My name is Don Cedar. I'm 31 years old and I have a Dutch nationality. My name is Katrina Kertisova. I'm 31 years old and I'm from Slovakia. My name is Connor Hannigan. I am 26 years old. I am Canadian and I'm also a British citizen. My name is Paul Nelke. I am 24 years old. I am from Munich in southern Germany. My name is Diana De Viva. I'm 35 years old. I'm Italian. My name is Dylan White. I'm 32. I'm proud to be Canadian. My name is Beata Patashova. I'm Lithuanian. I'm 29. I'm Eugenia Johnny, 33 years old, and I am from Albania. My name is Nadia Kowalczykova. I am a program manager and fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. My name is Finley Grimble. Hello, my name is Tobias Foxby. I am 19 years old from Florida in Norway. Hello, my name is Philip Lefebvre. My name is Anvesh Jain. Hi, I'm Laura from Hungary. Hello from Windy Istanbul. The treaty we are signing here today is evidence of the path they will follow. It shall be regarded as an action covered by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. I called it NATO 2030, and it has uh, three priorities. Keeping NATO strong militarily, making NATO stronger politically, and ensuring that NATO has a more global approach. Good morning, good afternoon. Wherever you're watching from, welcome to the NATO 2030 Youth Summit. Over the next few hours, we'll get straight into the future of NATO, together with numerous senior leaders, numerous young leaders, as well as more than 900 participants, we'll be discussing how the Alliance can remain ready today to meet the future challenges of tomorrow.
Now, if you haven't had a chance to look at the program, then please do so. You can find it in full detail at the Munich Security Conference website. But throughout the afternoon, you will be able to take part in different breakout sessions. So when the time comes, you'll be able to do that via the buttons one, two, or three on the right side of your screen. But please make sure that you always come back to channel one after the breakout sessions, because this is where the main joint events will be happening, and we'd hate to lose you. We're also going to get you involved early on by asking you various poll questions throughout the event to make sure that you can give us some short, snappy answers and that you're staying with us. When the time comes, you should be able to see the button on your screen, on the left-hand side of your screen, that says live polling or the polling button. So please do take part because we'd really like your input as much as possible. Just a quick word of advice, though. You'll only be able to participate in the polls if you're actually a registered participant. If you're watching via the live stream, please do also put your comments in via the hashtag NATO2030. And you're really welcome to keep the conversation going on social media, and I hope you will. So for those of you who are registered participants, we're going to test out your polling skills now, or rather, we're going to test out our polling skills now. And we're going to ask you our first question. So if we could see it up on the screen, please. Our first polling question is, what are the main reasons why we need NATO? So what are the main reasons why we need NATO? And I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to answer that, so get thinking. We have some very clear opinions emerging here, which is good. We're just going to give it a little bit longer. Keep the votes coming. And I think we will now close the poll. So if we could see the full results up on the screen, please. And it seems that we have an overwhelming winner there, because with almost half the votes, option D is the one that people seem to be the most inspired by. So NATO's reason for existing is that we need it to stand up for democratic values, followed closely by defending our territory, option C, and maintaining a strong bond between Europe and America, option F. So this is very interesting food for thought, and I'm sure we'll be discussing that as we go further on throughout the afternoon. In the meantime, one of the reasons why we're even here today is because the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, is very enthused by the idea of bringing young leaders into the discussion process of what NATO should look like in 2030. And uh, Secretary General, I'm very pleased to welcome you to welcome everybody in the audience more formally. Thank you so much, Laura, and many thanks to the Munich Security Conference for organizing the NATO 2030 Youth Summit with us today. You are an outstanding platform for addressing future security challenges. Good afternoon, Europe, and good morning, North America. Let me start by congratulating Joe Biden on his election as the next President of the United States and Kamala Harris as the next Vice President. I have worked with uh, Joe Biden for many years and I know him as a strong supporter of NATO and the transatlantic relationship. A strong NATO is good for Europe and good for North America. And I look forward to working very closely with uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to further strengthen the cooperation between North America and Europe in the years to come. When NATO leaders last met, they asked me to lead a reflection on how to make our strong alliance even stronger, forward-looking and fit for the future. And that is why I'm holding this Youth Summit, uh, NATO 2030, today. Because NATO 2030 is about your future, your freedom, and your alliance. When I was your age, everything, I grew up uh, in Norway. 
And uh, my views and uh, values uh, were shaped by the world around me. We lived under the shadow of the Cold War and the threat of nuclear attack. But we felt safe because we were part of an alliance and trusted that our friends in NATO would always come to our aid. One for all and all for one. That solemn promise has kept NATO allies safe for more than 70 years. Today, NATO's core mission continues, preserving the peace and deterring aggression, on land, at sea, in the air, in space, and in cyberspace. From pandemics to infodemics, cyber attacks to climate change, our world keeps on changing and NATO is changing with it. So in a more uncertain world, we need a strategy to deal with uncertainty. In a more contested world, we need a forum to settle our differences. And in a more competitive world, we need strength to tackle global challenges. For all these reasons, we need NATO. And let me explain why. First, if COVID-19 has shown us anything, it is that our world is more unpredictable than ever before. The only thing we can be certain of is uncertainty itself. When I was asked to become NATO Secretary General in early 2014, the world was a very different place. Few had heard of ISIS and few predicted Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. Since then, Russia has continued its aggressive actions. We have seen new levels of brutality from ISIS and other terrorist organizations. And China has been asserting its economic and military weight on the world stage. We do not always know what the next crisis will be. But we do know that we are stronger together than alone. In times of peace or conflict, it is good to have friends. We have seen the value of our alliance in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, delivering much needed medical aid and supporting civilian efforts to save lives. In a more uncertain world, we need to strengthen international cooperation and international institutions that uphold it, like NATO. And we need to invest more in our collective defense to defend the right of each of us to live our lives in peace and freedom. Second, in a more contested world, we need a forum for resolving our differences. It is no secret that NATO allies do not always see eye to eye. We have had our differences in the past, and we have them today. NATO provides a platform to bring allies together. So when we disagree, we can sit down together, speak together, and solve our differences. NATO is the only place that brings Europe and North America together every day. NATO is the place to discuss, decide, and act on issues that affect our shared security. And that brings me to my final point, that in a world of greater competition, we need strength and solidarity to address global challenges. Today's security challenges go beyond national borders. They cannot be addressed by any country alone, not even the biggest. Whether we are talking about the rise of China or climate change, the spread of nuclear weapons or cyber attacks and disinformation, when we speak as one, our voice is louder. When we decide and act together, our words and actions are 30 allies strong. NATO brings together almost 1 billion people half of the world's economic and military might. We also have a network of like-minded partners around the world, from Finland and Sweden 
to Australia, New Zealand, South Korea and Japan. So as we face even greater global competition, we must more work even more closely together to defend our values and way of life and to strengthen the global norms and institutions that have kept us safe and strong for decades. Faced with a more uncertain, contested and competitive world, we need a strategy to deal with uncertainty, a forum for a solving of differences and the strength to tackle global challenges. And that is why we need NATO now, for the next decade and beyond. You, tomorrow's leaders, both in North America and Europe, have the greatest stake in our security. So NATO 2030 is the chance for you to step up and safeguard your future, your freedom, your alliance. Now is the time for you to share your views and tell us your ideas. So welcome to the NATO 2030 Youth Summit. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Now, to help you on your NATO 2030 quest, you've handpicked a team of young leaders to advise you on how to strengthen the alliance over the next 10 years with a view to meeting the security challenges of the next decade. Now, there are 14 of these emerging young leaders. They've been handpicked or nominated by prestigious youth leadership programs from across the alliance, and they're all under 35. Let's meet some of them. I would like to hear your views, to have your ideas, your proposals of how NATO can remain strong. Alice Pilongalon, French. My name is Don Cedar and I have a Dutch nationality. My name is Martin Dimitrov. I come from Bulgaria. My name is Corey Flesser. I am from the United States. My name is Andrea Rafael I'm from Spain. I'm Amri Mafedon and I'm British. Hi, my name is Gude Jensen and I am from Kiel, Northern Germany. My name is Katrina Kirtisova and I'm from Slovakia. My name is Tanja Lacic and I'm a Romanian living in Belgium. My name is Janu Kocilic. I'm a European coming from Czech Republic. My name is Claudia Manejan and I'm from Italy. My name is Mark Steinberg. I'm Latvia. Hi guys, my name is Ulrich. I'm a Danish national living in Copenhagen. My name is Ken Long and I'm a proud 31-year-old Canadian. So thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Tell us, why was it so important for you to have this Young Leaders Initiative in the first place? So I'm actually very delighted to be able to present uh, the NATO 2030 Young Leaders Group today. And uh, I appointed the group because I wanted them to help me, to assist me in, uh, in making sure that NATO is fit for the future. So I'm very much looking forward to their ideas, their proposals, uh, and I'm extremely grateful that they are all joining us uh, today. Well, I can see them up on the screen now, and I know you have many questions for them, so we're going to put a couple of them to them now. Uh, would you like to ask your first question? Yes, my first question is actually about uh, climate change, because we, we know that climate change has uh, security implications, uh, and therefore we also need to address and discuss uh, what is NATO's role in responding to uh, climate change. And I'm going to ask Katerina Kurtishova to ask, answer this question. Thank you, Secretary General. And I'm really happy that we are starting this discussion with a focus on climate change, which I consider to be one of the most profound challenges facing the Alliance today. I think that politically, uh, the two degrees debate should be as significant as the 2% debate we've been having. I think that uh, NATO should dedicate um, more attention to climate related security risks in its strategic communication strategy. Uh, let's just imagine that we have a two degrees campaign that would be as widespread and as successful as the We Are NATO campaign has been. 
we have to uh, remember that today member states approaches uh, to the relationship between climate change uh, and security vary and this has prevented the alliance uh, from being able to reach a consensus on the matter. Uh, and it's not just that Trump's administration's climate U-turn, but it has also been the case uh, in various Central and Eastern European countries. So I think that while um, the election of Joe Biden uh, presents an opportunity to re reinvigorate transatlantic cooperation on climate change, NATO also needs to get Central and Eastern European countries more engaged and to really lead by example and encourage all member states to advance emissions reductions uh, uh, and adaptation investment. And I think operationally, uh, we can do more both on the prevention and on the response side. So just to give you one example, dealing with the root causes more effectively uh, will require the Alliance to increase organizational foresight, as well as uh, to improve its analytical and risk and situational and threat assessment capabilities. And I think that also when it comes to the militaries in the field, we can go beyond uh, their contribution to emissions reductions because they can also seek to reduce their impact uh, uh, when it comes to water and food. And I think uh, just to conclude, uh, we have to remember that climate change is not just a transatlantic issue. It is a global issue and that NATO needs to work alongside not just the EU, but also uh, other security and military institutions, uh, as well as agencies in the field. And I think that sharing of expertise and training for locally engaged personnel is crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina. And our next question please, Secretary General. So my next question is about uh, terrorism. Uh, NATO has uh, been at the forefront uh, in the fight against terrorism for many uh, years, but that uh, fight continues. Uh, just recently, we have seen terrorist attacks in France, in, in Austria, and Afghanistan, and also in other countries. So the question is, how can NATO further strengthen its uh, role in the fight against uh, terrorism? And that question goes to Cory Flaeser from the United States. Thank you for the question, Secretary General. As we all acknowledge, addressing terrorism is complex and NATO has made considerable strides in the last few decades to advance its counterterrorism efforts, mostly through education, engagement, and capability development. I think these efforts will continue to be central to the Alliance, but it offer two shifts in NATO's role with partners to fight terrorism in the future. The first, NATO should work with its partners to examine new means of employing existing military capabilities to build the legitimacy of security actors and strengthen their relationships among local populations. These efforts should focus on eroding support for terrorist activity while demonstrating the security sector's role in upholding human security. The second is to prioritize engagement with women and youth as critical stakeholders in preventing and countering terrorism. These groups are not monoliths or homogenous, and they possess diverse perspectives that are instrumental to building community level resilience to terrorist activities. Women and youth are attuned to the local drivers of support for terrorist groups, and their deliberate and meaningful engagement is also necessary for strengthening the relationship between the security sector and civil society. So NATO has a key role to play here as the military alliance. These two shifts in NATO's role with its partners, I think, can build on NATO's previous counterterrorism efforts, but they will also allow the alliance to adapt to the evolving nature of terrorism in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Corey. Now, Secretary General, this is so important to you that you haven't just kept your questions to yourself. You've also asked current NATO leaders or leaders of NATO allies to put their questions to the young leaders as well. And we're going to hear from a selection of them now, starting with German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Sehr geehrter Herr Generalsekretär, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich grüße Sie alle, die Sie an diesem NATO-Jugendgipfel teilnehmen. Und ich danke Ihnen, dass Sie sich mit Fragen zur transatlantischen und globalen Sicherheit auseinandersetzen und das in einer Zeit, in der uns durch die Coronavirus-Pandemie große Sorgen bereitet werden. Das ändert aber nichts daran, dass wir auch andere große Herausforderungen im Blick behalten müssen. Vor 30 Jahren wurde Deutschland wiedervereinigt. Kein eiserner Vorhang teilte mehr Europa und die Welt in Ost und West. Doch das Ende des Kalten Krieges bedeutete mitnichten das Ende von Bedrohungen. So manche Krise, gerade auch vor Europas Haustür, Terrorismus und hybride Kriegsführung erfordern neue Antworten. Verschiedenste Entwicklungen, nicht zuletzt im Zuge des Klimawandels, 
können rasch sicherheitspolitisch relevant werden. Frieden, Freiheit und Stabilität zu bewahren und unsere Werte, auf denen unser Zusammenleben gründet, zu verteidigen, das ist und bleibt der Auftrag der NATO. Wie aber kann die Nordatlantische Allianz ihrem Auftrag unter geänderten und sich weiter ändernden Bedingungen gerecht werden? Wir wollen Antworten auf diese grundlegende Frage geben. Zum einen mit dem Reflexionsprozess mit Experten und zum anderen mit einer gesellschaftlichen Diskussion zur NATO 2030. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie sich in diese wichtige Debatte einbringen. Und ich bin schon sehr gespannt auf Ihre Vorstellungen und Anregungen dazu, wie wir die Akzeptanz der NATO gerade auch bei jüngeren Menschen stärken können und wie wir unsere Allianz auf die neuen Herausforderungen vorbereiten können. Viel Erfolg bei Ihren Beratungen und herzlichen Dank für Ihr Engagement. And I'm going to ask Tanja Lacic to answer that question. Thank you. I'd like to answer this question by telling you about this microscopic animal, which is rather obscure. I only learned about it by watching David Attenborough, of course. It's called the tardigrade, and it's quite a remarkable animal. Tardigrades are really one of the most resilient animals out there. They survived all five mass extinctions and are over 500 million years old. Now, I don't know if NATO will live to see its one millionth year old, but I do think the tardigrade can teach it some survival lessons. So how does the tardigrade survive all possible environments from radiation to outer space? Well, it not only adapts, it super adapts. Now, NATO also knows a thing or two about adaptation, but right now, NATO needs to adapt not only on one front, but on multiple fronts. For one, NATO needs to address new social demands from increased polarization to shifting priorities. NATO needs to also address invisible threats from pandemics to bots. And NATO also needs to fortify alliance cohesion at home. But maybe most importantly, NATO needs to get creative of, about how it uses its power. So NATO not only needs to become a creative super adapter, but I also think that NATO could use something called a damage suppressor. Now, ironically, this is not something that NATO officials came up with, but rather it's the unique protein that has kept the tardigrade alive all these years by basically keeping its DNA intact when facing all these threats. Now, NATO's DNA is made of its values and it's made of solidarity. So NATO, let's adapt, but let's make sure our DNA also stays intact. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And our next question comes from Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Hi, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Et bienvenue au Sommet de la Jeunesse OTAN 2030. Je dis toujours que les jeunes ne sont pas seulement les leaders de demain. Vous êtes déjà des leaders d'aujourd'hui. From the security implications of climate change to combating disinformation and now dealing with the threat of the COVID-19 pandemic, your voices, your opinions, and your leadership are more important than ever before. So thank you for getting involved and stepping up. Ensemble, on va bâtir un monde plus sûr, plus juste et plus inclusif pour aujourd'hui et pour demain. Now, today I want to discuss disinformation and the threat that it presents to democracies around the world. As you all know, the spread of disinformation has drastically increased in the past decade. Social media, while contributing a lot of good to our daily lives, has also increased the amount of false, misleading, and inflammatory disinformation that our citizens see every day, which has contributed to an erosion of trust in our democratic and international institutions. So my question to all of you is this. How can institutions like NATO and democratic countries help in the fight against disinformation so we can ensure countries can build back a better society for everyone? And that question goes to Kevin Vuong. Well, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. As you know, NATO as a collective is a force to be reckoned with. We're 30 countries that will be home to nearly a billion people by 2035. And if NATO was a country today, we'd have the third largest population and the second largest economy with a GDP per capita that's nearly two and a half times the global average. So let's leverage our collective power for our collective defense against disinformation. There are NATO standard rounds that our militaries use 
And we do that to maximize interoperability. So let's create a transnational standard that can guide companies, governments, and perhaps most importantly, the citizens of democratic countries to fight disinformation. In the absence of this, we leave it up to various companies as we've seen on social media to set their own. And these inconsistencies are vulnerability that can be exploited by our adversaries. So Mr. Prime Minister, I hope that you and other leaders will stay tuned for the robust set of recommendations that my peers and I will prepare over the next couple of months for combating disinformation and how we can build back better together. Thank you, Kevin. And our next questioner is Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Hello, everybody, and thank you to Jens Stoltenberg for inviting me to speak at this NATO Youth Summit and to all of you for taking part. Today, you're going to hear about the amazing work that NATO does and how for more than 70 years, this alliance has acted as a giant shield of solidarity, protecting a billion people in Europe and North America. And yet, if NATO is going to guarantee our peace, liberty and prosperity for the next 70 years, we must respond to emerging threats and challenges. One of the biggest is the way new technologies are transforming every aspect of our lives. So, there are two questions I want to put to you. How can the Alliance best use technology to help create a safer world? And what more can we do together to stop others from exploiting our own growing dependence on technology? Addressing those two questions will, I believe, help to ensure that NATO continues to keep us safe in the future. And I wish you every success with today's event. And those two questions go to Jan Lukasevich. Thank you for those questions, uh, Mr. Johnson. So uh, let me answer them. Uh, for the first questions, there are multiple areas where technology can help us create a safer world. Let's name a few. I think we should use the newest AI and big data technology tools to make data-driven, better, and swift decisions. Swiftness appeared to be very recently during the COVID-19 crisis around the world, a crucial deciding element. Moreover, these tools can help us tackle ongoing information hybrid war. Secondly, we should focus on new domains such as cyberspace, actual space which provide us with opportunities to expand our knowledge, technology, scientific and military advantage. Last but not least, I would put stronger emphasis on elementary and applied research and technology transfer. NATO membership states have a huge know-how and brain pool which can brew brilliant and useful solutions we may need in future. To answer your second question, uh, I think we should focus on education. It is a great paradox that uh, the more we are dependent on technology, the less we understand it. As an alliance, we should change that. Technology shouldn't be a black box, uh, which allow people to be manipulated and confused, uh, especially in this uh, disturbing world with uh, chaotic information. NATO should help provide solutions and tools that would help us educate people to be independent, informed, and a lot, lot harder to be manipulated. And Jens, still, thank you very much, Jan. And Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General, is still with us in the studio. Jens, tell me, what is it that you've picked up on so far from the discussion that you find interesting? As in one way, I think the most important message is that there are so many different issues NATO has to address at the same time, from technology, disinformation, collective defense, climate change, terrorism, and many other uh, issues. And they are different, but they have one important thing in common, and that is that for NATO to succeed, we need to be able to change. So kind of permanent change, permanent adaptation is the key to NATO success, and that's also the main purpose of uh, NATO 2030, is, is to make sure that we are changing and that we're listening to young people as we are uh, becoming fit for the future. Thank you very much. We're now going to go to our next question, which is Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. This year, my country celebrated 75 years of peace and freedom. Since the end of the Second World War, children have been able to grow up peacefully in the countries that make up the NATO alliance. Today, you might wonder, do we still need NATO? And the answer is, yes, we do. Because we cannot take our freedom for granted. 
It's true that since the end of the Cold War, freedom and democracy has spread further around the world. But the free and liberal societies of NATO's member countries and its many partners across the globe are not immune to outside threats. Today's dangers are different from those the world faced during the Second World War or the decades in which your parents grew up. Nowadays, we have to defend ourselves not only against guns and bombs, but also against new threats. Threats that are often invisible and can easily cross national borders. Your phone, your computer, your email and your social media can all be hacked and used against you. To counter those threats, we need to work together. We need to work within NATO, but NATO also needs to work with other partners like the EU. And of course we need to work with you, the younger generation. We need your technical expertise, your knowledge and your networks. So let me be frank and ask you this. What can you do as someone with specific knowledge and skills to make sure we can live in freedom after 2030? I hope we can count on you. Thank you. And that question goes to Gude Jensen. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, as the Chair of the Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid in the German Bundestag, my experience taught me and uh, continues to uh, teach me every day that freedom needs to be defended both on a smaller and a larger scale. For the smaller scale, it is fighting for the release of one single prisoner. It is demanding justice for a killed journalist because of his or her work, or it is supporting in work and in action people who are fighting for the future of freedom in Belarus, in Hong Kong or elsewhere. Because these small things, they matter. Every square inch we can take back of the shrinking space for civil society worldwide matters for the sake of freedom. And when, when it comes to the freedom in the digital age, we need to be aware that every single piece of legislation that is passed here with the rule of law in our countries, it may also serve as a blueprint for authoritarian regimes. This is a sphere where I can and will continue to work for freedom with a lot of my colleagues from across other parties. On a larger scale, and that is as important, we need a new emphasis and a new discussion about defending Western values, our values, the NATO alliances values. We need to talk honestly about which countries may play a long game in strategically undermining our freedoms in the world. And we need ways to approach these challenges. Of course, there are questions that fall behind in day-to-day -day politics, especially during a pandemic. So this is what I'm already doing and will continue to do. Reminding my government in Germany, but also elsewhere, initiating discourse like this in the media and pressing for a position when it comes to dealing with global powers such as China or also NATO members such as Turkey. More than ever before, we are dependent on partners if we successfully want to conquer these crises. These is, this is why we need to talk about how NATO, not only as a defense alliance, but also as a multilateral institution can help shape and conquer these crises and challenges. I'd like to take a little part in that endeavor as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guda. And our next question comes from Estonia and President Kirsti Kaljulaid. Hello, future leaders of NATO. New technologies have already changed the face of conflicts and warfare. For example, we already see how the use of drones has shifted the balance, not only in asymmetric conflicts, but now also in conventional warfare. But it doesn't stop here. Artificial intelligence may well undermine the technological age of the West. What will we do if our adversary's AI turns out to be smarter? than ours. In the past, it was usually the state and the military that drove technological innovation. Nowadays, innovation is shifting more and more to tech companies. We already see how some of our global competitors are effectively combining state and private sector resources in AI development. Hence, my question to you. What could NATO do so that the West won't end up as the biggest loser in this new 
technological race. And that question goes to Andrea Garcia Rodriguez. First of all, I would like to unmute myself and then thank Madam President of Estonia for the question. Uh, I believe that NATO should, first of all, anticipate the next technological revolution. And I'm not only speaking about AI, which is something that is already in, um, having an impact in our lives and in our security, but also on the new emerging technologies, such as quantum computing, that is, if not now, will definitely disrupt our security environment soon. Second of all, I would um, like to, to respond saying that we need to strengthen our cooperation and we need to strengthen NATO in order to be able to face these new challenges arising, as Madam President of Estonia said before. And this is cooperation strengthened passes not only for um, like creating uh, new defensive capabilities, but also pulling resources and certainly creating new offensive capabilities in certain domains, such as the cyber domain. We cannot guarantee defense if we do not build offensive capabilities as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. So Secretary General, you're still with us as well. Could you, what are your thoughts on the technology race and particularly artificial intelligence and how it's gonna change the landscape in the run up to 2030, but what also you think NATO should be doing to get ahead of that technology race? So I very much think that a new uh, disruptive technologies as artificial intelligence, but also many other uh, technologies, they are now fundamentally changing the threats uh, and the security challenges we all uh, face. Uh, actually, I believe that these technologies are changing the nature of warfare as much as the Industrial Revolution changed uh, the nature of warfare uh, a couple of uh, centuries ago. And of course, NATO has always had the advantage of uh, having a, a technological, technological edge uh, on all other potential uh, uh, adversaries or, 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 or comp competitors and uh, we need to be able to make sure that we keep that technological edge when we now see such uh, profound changes taking place. This is partly about investing, partly about you know, uh, one of the reasons why we need to invest more in our security so, so we have uh, the resources to develop new technologies and, uh, and to keep this edge. But it's also very much about being able to work together, governments and private companies. And one of the big advantages we have in NATO is that we are 30 open, free societies with dynamic, uh, competitive economies. And I think that's actually one of the best bases we have for uh, being able to develop uh, new technologies. Thank you. And we're now going to go to Spain for our next question. And Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. In 2022, Spain will celebrate the 40th anniversary of its accession to the North Atlantic uh, Alliance. This uh, represented uh, the first milestone of our new democracy, rejoining the international community and the starting point of an increasing responsibility in the international arena, always based on multilateralism and rules-based uh, order. Much has happened in these 40 years and the world has deeply changed. Globalization is the hallmark of our times and we have always believed that NATO, that unites democracies that share common principles and values, must be a driving force of stability also in our neighborhood. That is why my country Spain has always strived for a sound partnership policy, for instance with our Mediterranean partners, we believe that security is a two-way street, so that the more resilient our partners are, the better we can ensure security in our societies. Today, more than ever, we depend on each other. So I would like to know how we can deepen these association programs from a multilateral perspective in order to improve what we do and how we work together. Thank you. And that question goes to Ulrich Troller-Schmed. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for the question. And thank you, Secretary General, for inviting us to be here today. I think my answer um, for how we work abroad should start at home. Is NATO an institution or a community? If we merely see it as an institution, we will bury our values in administration. But if we see NATO as a community of democracies, we have opportunities for adaption. It's time maybe to say what we stand for at home. 
and band together with other democracies abroad. We are no longer bound by the Cold War in Europe. It's time to recommit, recommit to free institutions for the 21st century that we use and we use it to bind us together as allies at home and then stand in solidarity in the face of authoritarian challenges to free peoples abroad and to the challenges that they might have. So what can we do? Well, first of all, for the Southern neighborhood, we can bring the African Union closer. Second, we can give the EU a seat at the table of the North Atlantic Council. Third, we can consider letting other democracies maybe even ally with NATO or join NATO, Japan, Australia, Mexico. It's bold ideas, but if we don't dare talk about innovation, we will avoid potential tension, but we will also risk losing our economic foundation, security and values in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich. And our final head of state question goes to, from, comes rather from Zuzana Chaputsova, the president of Slovakia. I find it highly important to engage our young and bright, as one day it will be you setting the course and taking the decisions. One of the key topics we have been discussing in recent years is how to make our alliance politically stronger. Because to truly adapt to the dynamics of ever-changing world is not only about increasing military power. It is equally about investing in our unity and credibility. And this comes from the ability to act as one and swiftly, when needed, to protect our freedom, democracy and the rule of law, to defend our peoples and to maintain the trust of our citizens in our efforts. Thus, my question to you is this. In 2030, what will a truly politically strong alliance look like? What must we do today to make it happen? Thank you, and I wish you fruitful discussions. And that question goes to Don Cedar. Thank you so much, President. As the world's most powerful defense alliance, a politically strong alliance is crucial for the future and continuation of not only the NATO, but for ensuring a stable world. As we grasp this moment to reflect on where we see our alliance 10 years from now and how it will continue to keep us safe, I would like to contribute three quick points that we need to look to, to today to enhance the alliance. First of all, it will require a reassessment of the NATO's core values. Not only the times, but also the threats and the, and the interests have shifted and it is crucial to, while keeping the diplomatic ties intact, reassess why the NATO should be more relevant than ever and what it truly is that binds us. Shared values create trust, strength, a sense of belonging, and it, and it is crucial that, that we re-examine openly and agree for the future on what basis the NATO countries should strive to move the alliance forward. Second of all, we need to raise awareness among the citizens of the NATO alliance current countries. It is essential that we engage the community so that the alliance maintains, adapts, and grows a strong democratic support in all the alliance, uh, in all of the countries of the, uh, of the alliance. And third, and lastly, to uphold its mission to strengthen the transatlantic cooperation, we need strong societies. We need to invest in each other in democratic processes, but also in in combating disinformation to make sure that we as individual NATO countries can be stable and therefore can provide for a stable and strong NATO. I, I truly believe that by sowing a seed today, we will be able to reap the harvest of a strong NATO in 2030. As the NATO young leaders, we will try to provide the NATO the next couple of, couple of weeks with some well taught uh, ad advice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Secretary General, just to wrap up in this discussion, what would a politically strengthened alliance look like in 2030? And what did you think of Don, what Don had to say on that matter? So first of all, I think that it's a, it's a bit early to conclude because the whole purpose of NATO 2030, the, 
the, the, the work of the uh, young leaders group and, and, and the whole process is to actually get some proposals, some ideas, some input uh, uh, to help us shape and, uh, and, uh, and change NATO so we are fit for uh, the future and, uh, and that we are ready to also be a strong alliance in, in 2030. So this is a start of process, a bit early to conclude the, the process. I'm looking forward to the proposals from, for instance, the, the young leaders group. Having said that, I think there are some key uh, uh, issues that, has, uh, that have to characterize NATO in, in, in 2030. One is that it has to be military strong uh, because we face uh, new and more challenging uh, threats uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, evolving security uh, uh, challenges. And therefore, we need to invest uh, both in military capabilities, but not least also uh, uh, to keep our technological edge. Then we need to strengthen NATO as a military, no, as a political alliance, and that's exactly about how to, we work with, with partners all, all over the world, uh, in Europe, but also uh, 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 globally. And it is about how we address differences b between NATO allies. There is no way to hide that sometimes uh, uh, NATO allies disagree, but then we need to be able to sit down and find uh, solutions, ways, ways to deal with our differences. And the third aspect, which I think is extremely important for uh, NATO, is that uh, we should remain a regional alliance, uh, Europe and North America, but we need uh, to have a more global approach, uh, taking into, uh, the, uh, in, in, into account the fact that, uh, for instance, the rise of China uh, is uh, changing the global balance of power. And that matters for NATO. And we see that China is coming closer to us, um, investing in our infrastructure, uh, this is about resilience, in the Arctic, in Africa, uh, and of course in cyberspace. So we need to uh, respond to the fact that more and more of the challenges we face are global and therefore NATO needs a global approach. Thank you very much. Thank you to our young leaders for your answers. Thank you very much to the current NATO leaders for your questions. Stay with us because after the break we'll be doing a scenario building exercise on what the world in 2030 will look like. But please stay tuned after the short video.